Welcome to another interview of Room for Discussion today. While not all of you might know his name, you are certainly aware that this university does have a rector, and today we'll be talking to him about the various opportunities and education has to offer for us. He spent most of his career at the University of Twente, but recently made the switch to the University of Amsterdam, where he is now the rector magnificus. Um, and during uh, the celebration of the 339 uh, birthday of this university, he was officially named uh, rector. In his inaugural speech, he talked about the changing identity of academia and the renewed challenge is it faces. Uh, today, we'll be talking to Peter Paul Verbeek about these challenges and which opportunities uh, he thinks they provide. Um, th also, everyone in the audience, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, of course, there are uh, also people here who would like to make their voices heard. Um, and we would like everyone um, to ask everyone to politely wait to voice any questions or opinions you have for the part in the interview where this is possible. Uh, we have time for audience questions today. Uh, I am Elias. I'm Kuhn. Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, welcome Peter, Peter Paul Verbeek to the stage. Welcome. Thank you. So, um, before we start with the interview, we would just like to give everyone in the audience a bit of an idea of what the title of Rector Magnificus entails exactly, because not everyone might be familiar with that. So, to do that, we asked you to send us some pictures beforehand. So, we have uh, the pictures here, and they'll be on the screen for the <laughs> audience. So, can you just give us a bit of an explanation of what we're looking at here? Oh, wow. Well, I just tried to give you an impression of the things that I do. Maybe on the bottom right, you see all the things that uh, come with the role, the kind of responsibilities that a rector has. Uh, basically, I think you could summarize it as all the academic things, everything that's about education, research, the impact on society, making sure that these things run well. Uh, and uh, that also has a link to, of course, academic integrity, academic freedom, international relations. Um, and that means that, um, yeah, you also have a lot of discussions with people within uh, UVA, the deans, obviously, uh, the uh, education committee, the research committee, uh, and uh, also the CSR, the student council, are uh, part of what I do. Okay. And um, if we look at, at the other... Um, uh Photos. I think this is during your uh, so in the in the top right. Yeah, no, this is no, no. during <laughs> your uh, it, it, yeah your inauguration. Yeah. I just thought I'd give you some impressions yeah. of what because I've that, been that has been like a month uh, now. Yeah, well, actually yeah. maybe two two or three weeks ago. Two or three weeks ago, January it's nine. Very fresh. Uh, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but that's also I just wanted to show the picture because it maybe shows a bit of the role uh, as a rector. You are also a bit, I think the the academic face of the university. Yeah. But I also, of course, wanted to show uh, the two other people with uh, whom we are leading the university, yeah. Jan and Geert, who you see on the, on the picture as well. Um, and um, I also wanted to give an impression of the things that you also do outside of the university. So, for instance, uh, uh, the picture uh, where you see the Minister of Education and the S State Secretary of Culture on their backs. From the back, yeah, yeah, yeah with, the, with a, the painting. Yeah, uh, yeah. there was a visit to the Rijksmuseum with uh, NICAS, it's an institute for art conservation that we run. So also these kind of things is what you do. And I also gave three pictures uh, on the lower left. Yes. Maybe to indicate three of the main things that I'm currently working on. And one of them is the, the, the four themes of our strategic plan. Yeah. So we have four themes uh, that we want to work on. Sustainability, uh, inclusive society, uh, and health. Um, and so that, that's um, one of the things that I really hope to get running even better than it already does in the coming year, to develop interdisciplinary forms of collaboration between the faculties, also with societal organizations, citizens, etc. Then there is uh, the whole movement of recognition and rewards. Uh, this might be a bit far away for students, but it's actually how to reward uh, people who work uh, at the university, not only along the lines of doing research, but also along the lines of teaching uh, or uh, the impact you have on our society. And another picture is about uh, the theme of technology. So how could technology maybe play an even stronger role in the profile of the University of Amsterdam? 
Ja, er is een lot lot of movement on that field uh, nowadays. Definitely. Of course, we have a very strong profile in uh, data science, information technology, AI. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could make that even stronger somehow. Okay. We'll talk about that uh, further in the, the interview. Um, maybe to, to start off, uh, as you said, uh, it's only three weeks ago that you were uh, installed in your um, uh, position. Um, but you were once a student too. Yeah. Um, and we thought it would be interesting to maybe know a bit more about that. Um, so, um, your student life, when we look at uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, <laughs> wow. how, okay. uh, uh, how did you score? Uh, Maybe I should stick to the rock and roll then, yeah. here, because I do play the piano a lot and we used to have a blues band. <laughs> And uh, the sex and the drugs, that's maybe for another occasion. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, a question we borrowed from co college tour, uh, maybe. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, you, you studied what uh, exactly? Physics and philosophy. So okay. it was a program in Twente. Actually, I, I just could not make a decision when I was in high school what I wanted to, to do. Mm. Uh, first it was classical languages, then it was astronomy, then physics, philosophy. And then um, I used to live in the southern part of the country. In Twente there was a program where you could combine physics and philosophy. I thought, okay, maybe I should do that if I can't make a decision. Yeah. And that appeared to be a very good choice. Because, because you stayed there for... 34 a, years. A number of... Uh, <laughs> Bizarre. Uh, yeah. Of course, also working on other places, but always with Twente as a basis. Because the field that I ended up in um, yeah, started to move there really fast and became actually world-leading in its field. So, Good place to be then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it, it was all about the impact of technology on human beings and on society. H how to understand that impact and how to do um, the ethics of it. So, you would say there wasn't a big reason to, to leave Twente, but you're sitting here today. Yeah. So, no, what, I, what changed <laughs> that made you think, Uva, new, new, uh, new I challenge? Think, uh, a feeling of commitment to science. Of, I mean, I had a super good role there. I was a distinguished professor, I had a budget. Uh, Everything that I did um, worked out well, no obstacles, you could say. And then this came on my path, and I thought, okay, if I want to contribute even more to science... This is... Then, yeah, and the reason is that I think the UvA is really a super interesting university, because, first of all, it's a really excellent university, it's a top university. Second, it's super societal. Mm. And so everyone here is societally engaged. Everything we do also starts from societal engagement. And I believe that we now live in a time where universities start to play a different role in society. We need ever more science in societies to make decisions. Uh, and also the agenda of the academia is influenced increasingly by societal issues. So the role of the university has changed. Yeah. And I think if there's one place where you can make this work, it's, it's here. Societal university yeah. and also more, more a progressive than 20. one. Yeah, because the full scope of science is here. Twente was only a technical university, yeah, yeah. also a very social one. But here the full scope of science is on board. And I think it's a very progressive university. So it is not a, a place where people try to stick to the past, but really want mm. to, to innovate, to, to make new things work. So it was a super good match. And then I thought, okay, maybe I should leave my comfort zone and do something very uncomfortable, <laughs> but also <laughs> very challenging and, and nice. Okay, well... Um, so we talked about your time as a student, of course, and <coughs> sitting in front of us here also a lot of students. How would you define an accomplished student? An accomplished student? A student, I think, who has managed to follow her or his own ambitions and path, who doesn't make strategic choices about a career, but really sticks to your own ambition, what really makes you motivated, which can be, uh, of course, a career, but can also be societal engagement, just interest and curiosity. And um, I hope for all students that they can also develop um, beyond only studying, right? Also developing s social relations, culture, sports, etc. And of course, UVA is a very strong place for this. Of course, this is a university, one of the tasks to facilitate in, in allowing students to become that accomplished student. So what type of responsibilities do you think the UVA has towards its students? making sure that they can study in an environment where they can do this, mm -hmm. right? So a safe place, a place that is accessible to everyone, a place that uh, offers top education. So I think, yeah, that's maybe among the, the, the most important things. Do you think when, when students walk out of the door here at the end of their studies that they should have 
more of a deep understanding of the academic aspect of education or that they should be prepared for the real world that they're stepping into? I think it's a false opposition, actually. I think, uh, yeah, the academic education that you get here um, should also somewhat prepare you for a societal role. But with this academic approach, this academic attitude, being somewhat critical, well-equipped, you can contribute also to dealing with big societal questions, especially the, the four ones that we are working also at uh, UVA, at health and sustainability, inclusive societies, digitalization. There are, uh, when you are a prospective student, you can of course choose from a number of studies, um, and uh, a lot of people will do that again uh, in the coming months uh, in the Netherlands. Is there one program that you can name that is underrated? Underrated? Yeah. You mean that it's actually much better than people think it is? Yeah, <laughs> and much more interesting. <laughs> wow, that, that, it would not be wise to give an answer. I, I think uh, we can always have an even higher esteem of everything that we do. But I, I have not actually seen anything here at UVA that is not good. That, that's really... What, totally struck me when I started here. Every door you open, there's something good, there's something very exciting behind it. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, it, it, it doesn't matter if everything is appreciated equally, uh, you would say, as well? Where do you mean? In society, at large, or uh, in it, I think for prospective students like law, medicine, th th those are the studies you typically ha uh, have more applicants than uh, those ah, who can be admitted. Okay. And there are, of course, a number of studies who are also very um, you know, thrilled when they get enough students. Yeah, uh, true, true. Every year. No, but yeah, I would still believe students have to follow their own path, their yeah. own preferences, everything that they really want to do by themselves. So no endorsements from the rector? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, just come to UVA, I think that's... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. You can see almost yeah. everything here, so... Yeah. Yeah. Um, then, when we look at uh, technology, and maybe also, like, the, um, the role of the university, um, you see this discussion in, in, in media and, and also, I think, in universities itself about the question, why um, is America succeeding in uh, developing big uh, tech companies on university campuses? So uh, the, the most uh, famous example is Facebook in, uh, uh, in Massachusetts, in Harvard. Um, yeah. and do, do you think the, the UVA would be, at this moment, be equipped enough to, to foster the next unicorn? I hope not actually, because I think uh, the American system uh, is a radical capitalist system where the big tech comes from that actually we are trying to, to fight a little bit. I think okay. we try to foster public values that we want to combine with the digital technology that we have here. So mm -hmm. if we would develop digital technologies in Europe at UVA, it would definitely be different than Facebook, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the, the ambition to, to foster a unicorn is not even there, you say? At least it would be a different one, right? I mean, n nothing wrong with starting a, a big tech company, I would say, but I hope, especially when it comes from UVA, that it would be loaded with values and not only with the ambition to make money. Okay, yeah. Oh. So talking about the, the economic responsibility that the university has, we've just had quite a tumultuous period in history with, with the pandemic and a recession, of course. So what role do you think the university has um, in protecting or taking care of its students against those challenges in society? You mean when there is a pandemic? But we For example, mental health support or economic support. Yeah, yeah. We do have a big responsibility there, I think. Of course, it's also, uh, I mean, you can't do everything you would want to do, maybe, because you also have a specific task in our society. And so our main task is to provide good education for students. But I think um, many universities have tried to, to be this place where students can feel safe, can study safely, and also um, during lockdowns where people could still meet. Um, yeah, so mental health is super important, it's also very high on our agenda. Um, also trying to even scale that up a bit further at the moment. Um, yeah, and for the rest, I think um, we have been trying everything we could. It was also before I yeah. came in, of course, to, 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 to keep the university accessible. Last question before we go to the audience questions. Yeah. Um, the, the burnout uh, under students uh, also at this university have been going up for several years now. Yeah. And um, do, do you feel maybe that the workload at the UVA could also be too high? That programs are designed in such a way that uh, there are always students who are going to struggle with the workload that is required uh, at minimum. 
it's hard for me to say. I, I, th I think I, I would need to understand more about the reasons for burnout, but it's definitely a, an issue. COVID was probably a, a very important cause for this. Yeah? So the reasons for the burnout might have to do with the study load, might also have to do with other things. So uh, it's definitely something that we would need to look into uh, further. Yeah. And at the moment with the CSR, we also have a discussion about the BSA. Uh, should we get rid of it or should it be milder also at the national level yeah the discussion so there might be some downsizing there's a discussion about it I don't know which direction it will take but it's definitely on the when do you expect to make a decision on that it's maybe more a decision by the ministry than by us okay. yeah. yeah so yeah. so no I, I I cannot even guess when <laughs> but so if it were up to you which side of the discussion are you leaning towards I actually um, still recall when we started the BSA as a way to help students to make sure that you don't end up in a situation that you don't succeed and that you mm -hmm. keep trying etc so um, if it is a really big cause of stress we might need to uh, lower the bar a bit but totally abandoning it would be uh, extreme uh, yeah okay. I think it would be a pity Okay, yeah. well, then we go on to audience questions. If you have a question, raise your hand or your sock for that matter. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we'll, we'll come to you. The mi microphone is over there. I think uh, you were the first there in the second row. Um, so the microphone will come to you. And then you can... Uh, ev everyone, by the way, gets one question, just to be sure. Okay, um, so <clears throat> I apologize beforehand because it's going to be kind of an uncomfortable question, uh, but those are the best kinds. Um, so what I wanted to, like one of the strategic pillars you mentioned is an inclusive society. And well, the UVA is kind of known as being one of the least accessible universities, like in like circles of students with a disability. It's well, doesn't really have a good reputation. And it's also, well, kind of known as a white university. So, yeah. What are your goal? What are your plans? What are the steps you're planning to take to change that, to make the UVA more inclusive and representative or representative of society at large? Yeah, thanks. A very important one, I think. So about accessibility, this is actually quite high on the agenda. Also part of our discussions with the CSR. Uh, so there's a task force uh, that has just been installed to uh, think through everything and to see where we can improve more. I think the last time we did this was like three years ago, if I'm correct. So that's uh, absolutely high on the agenda. The population of students is, of course, a tougher one. I mean, one third of the students studying in Amsterdam uh, has an in international background, so that already makes it uh, diverse. Um, and of course, there might be more that we could do. Uh, one of the big discussions is, of course, about the whole colonial past of our university and to what extent that could still play a role. So we also plan to investigate that more deeply in the coming period. Okay, following. Yes, you were very quick. <coughs> Hello. I'm uh, wondering a couple things. Firstly, what are you doing about the unsustainable growth of the university, and how do you plan to accommodate the influx, the increasing influx of students? Um, yeah. May I ask, unsustainable growth in, in what field? Uh? In the sense that more students are coming, in the sense that the UVA is growing in its, mm. okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, in its infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. This is a very big discussion. Also, really hard for us as a board to to steer, because the law doesn't help us here. The minister at the moment is trying to give universities the possibility to regulate uh, the influx of students, but that can only apply to students from outside the European Union, um, because inside the EU there are laws, and you cannot refuse students from those countries to register at the university within the EU. So that is an issue. And what we hope is to be able to regulate somehow uh, also the, the, the non-EU students, but it's also, it, it, it doesn't feel comfortable, right? Because it ends up being discriminatory against a specific target group of students. So it's really hard. And um, I must also say the discussion is balanced, maybe. I mean, some of the programs that we have actually really 
uh, well, for, for them it's important to have many students with an international background. Other ones have so many that they can hardly deal with it. So one rule for everyone uh, might not be the best solution. The minister might help. Before we go on, you, you were very quick with your hand, so you'll get the next question. But before that, we, we also had a few questions yeah. about uh, the, the, the student population. Um, because right now there is a shortage of 27,000 student houses in Amsterdam alone. Uh, and it is expected to rise to 44,000 by, yeah. by 2030. <coughs> um, so that's, yeah, that's huge. Um, and in July, you warned students not to come if they don't have a room. And then in September, the UVA even announced uh, that you want to slim down, basically, on the number of uh, international students uh, that you want to admit. And then the Minister uh, of Education said, well, there's no legal basis for that, so you can do that, um, which must have been a slap in the face, um, I can imagine. Um, but the, the, the question then becomes, um, do you believe there will actually be a solution for the problem uh, the young man just uh, described? It is hard, but I think there are other routes that we could explore. But they require uh, big forms of creativity, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, of course, one of the things would be if we would be able to uh, go down. That is also a very hard thing, but at the moment this is yeah. taking place. Yesterday in the parliament there was a discussion about this. The other thing is, could we um, seek for housing options a bit uh, outside Amsterdam? Okay. Without giving our student life, of yeah. course. Um, of co I mean, I know the issue myself. I'm trying to find an apartment here in Amsterdam, but I still haven't succeeded, so I... Okay. You, you are very Amsterdam. relatable in that sense. Huh? In sense. Yeah. 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 So, uh, of course, it's a different situation. Yeah. But, um, but it is, so, if you say we should look outside of Amsterdam, does that mean that the UVA is looking at housing in, in Lelystad for, for their students? For UVA is not looking at how we are not even allowed to offer housing to our own students, right? That's also not, not our role as a university. We get money to offer teaching and to make sure that people yeah. do research have societal impact. But we could, of course, try to look for solutions with partners around us yeah. to make sure that... So that are you talking to partners in... We are exploring Ireland. if that would be an option. But there are also downsides to it, of course, because student life is important. And if you actually would have a large population of students far away from where the action is, it mm. might also not be yeah. attractive. But the thing I try to say is, now that it's not sure yet how much we can do uh, regarding the influx of students, we might also start to look for other solutions. And, and those could be, apart from... Uh, the, 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 yeah, I the, think if the, the big housing issue well. is, is the main issue that you want to yeah. solve, I think. And is, do, do you expect the, the minister to maybe, you know, create a legal basis even for you discouraging uh, international sp students to come or even uh, yeah. be allowed to like... Uh, Maybe. I mean, we actually already are doing things like that. So we stopped uh, actively advertising our programs. Yeah. Um, that might help a little bit, but I think for Amsterdam it doesn't really help because we are a super good university with good reputation in a great city, so people just come to Amsterdam even without us advertising ourselves. So I'm not sure if that would be the most meaningful solution. Um, there are also other routes that are being explored. For instance, introducing a little Dutch language element in all the English language programs. A little hurdle. Also a good one, I think, because studying in the Netherlands also means that you would maybe want to participate uh, to okay. things that happen in the country. Yeah. It's, of course, also a little obstacle because you have to learn a little bit of Dutch then. But it could also make your study experience okay. huh. much more interesting. And then people get like grades for uh, their fluency or, or their, their efforts it's in... Uh, it's under development, so I have no idea which side it would take, but I would find it a pity if it would only about your language ability. I would hope that it would also be connected to what people learn in the program, that they can do yeah. something like community service learning in the Dutch context. Yeah. On, the, on the matter of language, I had a bit of a trivia question for you, because of course, Duvival offers a lot of courses to its students. Yeah. And the two most used languages, or most spoken languages in this course, are Dutch and English. But do you know how many subjects are being offered in each of those courses, respectively? Or in each of those? How many subjects are offered, offered in Dutch so, and English? Uh, uh, how many courses are in English at the UFA, and how many in Dutch? I, I'm sorry. I if you, if you were to take a wild guess. <laughs> this is a, a tricky question. Um, 
bachelor and master everything yes exists. everything in the course catalog we did select all and then only the master education is uh, largely english language so i would guess maybe 60 40. there are uh, 3423 courses in english at this university oh. and right now 55 in dutch that's incredible so, so what we were staggered as well. What do you think of that ratio? <laughs> I first want to see the numbers myself before I give a reaction. This, this is That's your totally website, right. so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let me first see the numbers. Okay. That's you, 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 you don't believe it? Yeah. Well, I know that uh, actually many of the programs we have have a Dutch language track and an English language track. Mm -hmm. But I would say if you have many programs that have both, that you would easily have much more than 55 courses in Dutch, so I've, it's, it's, it's hard for me to, to place that number. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So 60-40 is, is more realistic than you think? I, I, you asked me for a guess, so this was yeah, a yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. Oh. Oh. Shall we get back to the yes, audience questions? Good idea. Uh, I promise you with the, the red scarf. Yeah, all right. Um, First, I'd like the short remark that I am still receiving UVA advertisements for the Masters Week, at least. But then, let's keep that down for now. <laughs> okay. Um, like, I know UVA's first impulse is always to discriminate against those that have the least voice, but why not take less Dutch students? There are so many universities in the Netherlands, all of them so very good compared to the rest of the EU. Why accept less international students discriminate the internationals outside of Europe and not take in less Dutch students and have Dutch students wow. travel the world to other good universities. Wow. Well, I think even if we would want to do that, that, that would not be possible at all. We have a legal task and we have a role for Dutch society with Dutch tax money to provide higher education for Dutch students. So I think the discussion in Parliament is mainly about um, doesn't the international influx somehow threaten that role? And then we try actually to reverse that story and say, oh, it's very important that we have an international classroom and that we have an environment uh, where also international students can um, play a role. And that's why I also made the remark about the non-EER students. And I think contributing to something like capacity building in other parts of the world is uh, very important. I also see that as a task of the UVA, but it can never work against primary task that we have on Dutch tax money to provide higher education to Dutch students. Okay, who wants to further ask a question? There goes a hand, yes. Um, do you not believe that calling the riot cops on the occupiers of the Amsterdam Academisch Club is the exact antithesis to a university which believes in the free and fair production of knowledge and um, student autonomy? and proper discussion with the administrators of the university? I can, answer, I can understand that you asked that, but we also didn't call the police easily, right? Oh, so fucking hard for you, man, seriously. Uh, I would ask you to remain uh, respectful. Yeah, Point made. Go on. Yeah. And this is not a fake occupation. We're surrounded by security guards. What are you afraid of? We're coming for your job and you know it, and that's what you're afraid of. Seriously. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
discuss. Who has the following uh, question? We have, uh, yes, in the front. A microphone will uh, come to you. Go ahead. What is your question? Uh, so first, I wanna um, I wanna quote a little draft from your uh, opening lecture as a rector magnificus. Scientists and researchers must, even more now than before, prioritize ethics by acting responsibly when it comes to collaborations with social partners and by preventing improper use of our knowledge and technology. And you would think that someone with these commitments uh, would support the demands of the occupation in the 16th of January because uh, we want an immediate end to the improper use of our knowledge and technology, but a deeply destructive, violent, a neocolonial company that goes by the name of Royal Dutch Shell. However, however, this is not the case. They called the police on us, knowing full well the incredible danger that you put of students, students of color, when sending the cops to campus. The resolution from the negotiations was that the university would look at the um, research projects on a case-to-case -case basis to deem if these were sustainable. This is the literal definition of greenwashing. However, <laughs> however, however, when the CSR had a technical meeting with the researchers in these projects, they said that another use for these technologies is fracking. The university is promoting projects that could be used in fracking by the Royal Dutch Shell. So, the CVB, the board of directors, or of executives, sorry, is running the university like a business. So please, cut the ties. From the deep of my heart, from the depth of my heart, cut the ties. And to all the students and staff, we must decolonize, decarbonize, and democratize this university Join our movement, and I think that such a high position can make you easily forget the basics. But I'll give you a tiny lesson for free. Ethics 101, Shell is fucking bad. I think uh, the question can be summarized as, can you please cut ties with Shell? Why don't we stop with Shell? Yeah. I really understand the sentiment, right? And I think we share sincerely, and I hope you believe that, even though the socks seem to indicate something else. We share the ambition to contribute to a more sustainable world. As a board, we also try to make sure that we can do that as a university, where all voices are being heard. So some of the researchers actually are convinced, for good reasons, that they could also make a change by contributing to sustainable knowledge and that is also something ethical right so I think the role of the board is to give room for all these voices uh, academic freedom I think is a very important thing it comes with academic responsibility of course and that's why we feel that we should not by definition cut everything that we do with Shell but we are in a process right so we said that everything we do with Shell will currently be uh, investigated by the commission we have to work with external parties they will give their uh, verdict as it were at the same time there will be a uva wide debate where we uh, will see if we need to sharpen the guidelines that we have so we are actually on top of it we try to provide a podium for, for all the voices all the voices at uva that can be heard and that can help us think how to deal with shell I think it's important. I think um, maybe we should talk about uh, a bit about uh, the two things mentioned here. So uh, Shell and of course uh, the, the occupation. Yeah. So you are three weeks uh, in your new job. Three months actually, but yeah. yeah but, uh, I mean, like <laughs> the, the the operational side of it, so to say. And then one uh, afternoon, the phone rings. What 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 happens? Ah. An email comes in. An email comes in. Uh, announcing the occupation. Yes. You know. And then, things develop. Yeah, of course, we try to deal with that in a good way. Recognizing the concern, sharing the concern, 
and trying to find a good way to deal with it. So we uh, speak with the occupants. Uh, and actually, I was not in that meeting. Mm -hmm. Jan and Geert were. Yeah. Uh, listen to what their concerns are. Um, I think the most important thing is that we well, stay in touch, understand the So your, your colleagues went there and went discussed to, to, to the building. Yeah. with the students. Yeah. Yeah. And also indicated that we uh, are okay with demonstrations, not with occupations. Yeah. So we asked them also to guarantee that they would leave the building yeah. at some point, which did not happen. What is this and and then, uh, so they, they didn't leave, and, and how, how does the UFA then go, go on about um, dealing with it? So I have heard that many students are skeptical of Shaw's involvement in the university. You may think they're the bad guys, but they're actually leading the green energy transition. Did you know that Shaw actually spends 5% of the revenue on sustainable energy projects, like a research, here at UFA, just because they are involved in the killing of ogoni nine activists and irreversibly damaging whole ecosystems. It does not mean that all shell is bad. Yes, they lied to us about climate change for about 40 years, but that does not mean they didn't really change this time. They promised us they will do better, and here at UFA, we believe in dialogue and second chances. And don't blame Shell for sending riot cops and students. That was all on us, the seven back. And we will continue doing such things as long as Shell gives us money. Woo! So, you were telling uh, about uh, the moment <laughs> you got the we? email, and then your colleagues uh, went to the occupation. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, the, 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 then it of course becomes nasty, because then people don't want to leave. And I can see how that must be a huge responsibility, but also a very difficult choice to then uh, basically escalate. Yeah, that's not the right word, I would say. Okay, how, how would you describe it? That's very sweet of you, um, <laughs> but uh, I will go with the word, uh, Mr. Fabetje. No, so then uh, we decided to uh, report to the police that uh, there was a break-in yeah. in the building that we also need. And, and do the off campus! And do Yeah, so they went into the campus. Uh, and then do they then take over authority or is it still your call? No, no. So we reported to them and it's up to them to make an estimation of yeah. what to do. So because we, we, we looked, of course, at it. UFA has a long history with this. For example, the Maagdhuis bezetting. Yeah. That lasted for, what was it? It was, it was, at the time it was six weeks. So what was the difference? Do you know what the difference was why the police made the decision to go in this fast rather than to keep it last that long in 2015? I don't know all the details, but I think a thing that sometimes happens with occupations is that other groups and students join, and that there is a fear that it runs out of hand. So that might have been playing a role. Um, I think many of, of the students here and many students at the uh, student population are, of course, concerned about uh, eh, climate change, uh, Shell. Uh, but they are, are also the ones who like pay tuition that, of course, eh, together with the taxpayers' money makes the whole uh, yep. university run. So in, uh, to what extent um, do, you, do you think they deserve to have a say in the uni's uh, political choices, so to say? Uh, definitely a lot of them. I think, honestly, we are such a democratic university. <laughs> I, I was expecting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So of course there is a student 
council that is elected in a democratic way with a specific role, of course, to advise us and also to give consent to other things. But yeah. on top of that, we have many other places where democratic uh, yeah, processes are at work. Yeah. Uh, the university forum may be, be one of the most interesting uh, things I think that this university has, unlike many other ones. So a randomly selected group of people who are asked to give advice on a specific topic. And they actually have given us advice a few years ago about about the ethics of working with uh, external no. parties. Um, so let's then move on to Shell, I think. I think maybe also to look at this is in a wider context, of course. It is, a, it is a conversation that is being held in wider academia as well. So do you think the task of academia is to assist with the fight against climate change or rather maybe to lead in the, in the, the struggle? I think we could be leading in the scientific elements of the transition, right? And um, that would mean that with research, we could push the world into a more sustainable direction. And then the discussion, I think, is about the question, can we do this or should we even want to do this with a company like Shell, which is, of course, also a company with a very uh, many negative aspects in it. So it is, I think the discussion is, for me also, and for us as a board, how can we give room to all the voices in the university that care for a sustainable future, no. uh, where some of them would say, okay, it's a transition, it is not a revolution. If we stop fossil right now, we would also have a big issue. So we should exert all power we have to Shell and to other companies to move in that more sustainable direction. I think then the question becomes, which energy companies are welcome exactly. and which are not? Yeah. So, and well, so how, how, do you, how do you go on about um, deciding when you say yes and when you say no, what what makes the difference between a yes or an, and a no? So this is why we have a committee. I think it's not to the board to make every individual choice about every individual company. As an entire university, we want to have an infrastructure where together we can make the choices. So that's why we're organizing and, this and debate. What do they specifically look at? They have a framework now, but part of the uh, task that we set to ourselves in the coming weeks is to, to see if we need to adapt the framework, and that's yeah. what the discussions are about. But they have a, a, well, a set of guidelines, it's all on the on the UFO website where you can see it. Could you name a, a possible adaptation you are discussing? I think what's on the table, I think for many people, also here in the audience, is if we should do this on a case-by-case -case basis, or if some yeah. industries should be banned at all. Okay. Like, should we ban the weapon industry at all? Should we ban fossil fuel? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So you, you have a great support course, for that, I think. Yeah. No, it's, and, and, and I think it's an important discussion to have, but then we need to have a discussion where all voices are being heard. Yeah. And we're also... Go ahead. I, I lost track, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, no, no problem, no problem. Because um, the, the interesting thing would also be, I think, because uh, Shell is, of course, one company. There are many other energy companies who, who fund a lot of research. So is there, is there a company in the world of which you would say, we would immediately say, say no? Wow. Well. <laughs> I think, I think it's, an, it's an interesting example, indeed. I think tobacco industry, I'm, I'm not sure if we do anything there. I think for many people... Yeah. Because, the, the, because then, the, 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 then, of course, the question becomes... Why oil? Well, and why, why is that an immediate better. no? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, because that, 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 then you get the sense... Yeah, but, um, <laughs> they are not throwing anything. So <laughs> oh, uh, guys, it's upside down, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, activism is a lot of work, guys. Oh, oh, other side. Turn it around. <laughs> Because if you say tobacco companies hard no, and then Shell comes and you say we need the framework first, what makes the difference? I think the difference here would be we don't want to do anything with Shell if it comes to fossil, right? So the only thing that we want to do with Shell is the other stuff. And actually this is the current situation, but we are having this debate to see what we want to do with this in the future. Yeah, but and I think the... the, um, uh, the the most fair thing I can ask you then is, what will your stance be in this discussion? Because you are part of the discussion. You, as, as was mentioned, you have quite a high position at the, the UFA, so your voice matters. If I ask you, 
what will be your position in that discussion? What will it be? My position is that I want to be there for the entire UFA to together develop a policy. It's not just what I want. We have a democratic university. If I would say this is what I want and now you will do what I want, that's mm. not how you want to run a university. That's why actually we had the Maglehuis occupation. Right? We, are, we are a democratic university. I think maybe to, to finish off this section we can have one last question. Of course I would argue that you would agree that Shell doesn't have the best track record when it comes to caring for the planet. So there is also uh, the possibility to make a decision to engage in the similar types of research that would also benefit the fight against climate change in a similar way, but rather with other companies that are maybe fully dedicating their mission to, for example, um, methane adaptation, which is one of the studies that mm -hmm. Shell is funding right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is, I think here the choice is is it only about the research that is important and interesting, or is it also an attempt to push a company in a more sustainable direction? I think this is what the discussion should be all about. And uh, I mean, if you take the point of view from people working on this, I think that they share the same ambition for a more sustainable world, and they will also feel really frustrated if they cannot do something actively positive in that development. Mm -hmm. I think we go for a few audience questions and then we move on to te technology. Um, is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Uh, you are very quick, there in the back. Yes, you, yeah. The first time I've heard somebody say it was very big. No, uh, thank you. <laughs> Professor Verbeek, I, I'm, you'll forgive me if I'm a bit provocative, but I suspect you might have said the quiet part out loud when it comes to the occupation and democracy. You said the problem is, is that they get out of hand, they grow bigger, lots of other people join. That's exactly what happens when you have a discussion space, and this was one of the demands, that's actually not managed by senior management at the university. People come up with demands, for example, for real democratization. This is what happens. You just mentioned the Magda House. There was a reform progress, a reform process, a referendum. You completely ignored the demands of that process. So I don't know on what grounds you claim to have implemented any of the uh, democratic changes that your predecessors and so the same body promised to the university community at that time. So we know why you can't tolerate occupations. It's simply because you know what happens when people are free. Thank you for the question. I think um, you might misread what I tried to say. I don't think it runs out of hand if there is a big community of UFA people wanting to discuss Shell. The risk is that other groups from outside UFA who are violent could join. Do you want to hear what I want to say? Or not? Would you like to finish up your answer or shall we uh, move on? I keep losing track of my answers. When yeah, yeah, I, that's very understandable. Um, I, I would uh, lose track as well. Um, but do, do, do you feel like you want to respond more to the occupation issue uh, or should we move on to the next? I think I explained how we want to deal with this. And it doesn't mean that we don't want a place for discussion. Actually, we do want, we also offer to facilitate such a a space, but that building is also a building that was simply also in use. The kitchen was in use, there were events in, in that building, so you can't just give away a building. Space then, yeah, okay. Then we go on to um, the last part of the interview. We are, we are running short on time even now a bit. Um, I think you, you talked about technology in the beginning, and um, uh, I should actually leave this question to you, I see. Um, yeah, to talk about the future of education, because of course your study was on philosophy, technology, and the combination between those two. So we also wanted to talk about another challenge to education that is really up and coming right now, which is chat GPT. Oh, yeah. Of course, an issue that you've talked about. And I would like to quote the definition that the UVA currently maintains for plagiarism for that, which is the appropriation of other people's materials without giving proper credit. Of course, in this situation, 
definition other people's materials well, doesn't people, really apply. So it, do you think that definition should be should be adjusted? Yeah, I think we really need to, to, to learn to live with this new application. And actually there are also already quite interesting experiments with it. I just heard an example of Jessica Trotsky here uh, at, uh, in this faculty building um, who uh, gave an assignment to students where they had to ask ChatGPT to uh, code something and then to analyze actually how ChatGPT has been doing that and what they would have done differently somehow. So it means, I think, kind of a flexibility that we need to have to deal with the new ways in which technologies push science beyond its boundaries. In, in terms of that, um, of course, I think it's undeniable that students at this university are also using ChatGPT for the work that they are to hand in. Yeah. Have you heard of any examples of students being accused of plagiarism or having been disciplined for the use of ChatGPT? Not yet concretely, but I have heard the concerns about this, definitely. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to, 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 to see uh, to what extent um, student work was really student work. But I think most people really try to pick up the challenge in a different way. We, should, we, we might need better exams, as it were, um, if we um, yeah. want to live with ChatGPT. Will the UVA implement uh, AI detectors? <sighs> Don't know yet. <laughs> okay. But you could, uh, you could see the university maybe acquiring software. Definitely. I mean, I do know that at the national level, people are thinking about how to deal with this. And AI detection could be one of the options. Actually, uh, SimCheck, or what's uh, the software called, uh, is already working on something like that. Mm. Uh, so it definitely has a lot of attention. But I would say maybe the best way to go would not be only to do AI detection, but would also be to adapt our education to the existence of AI. Mm -hmm. So, if you would have to choose one of one of both, do you say that AI is more of a threat, or more could be benefiting the current system of education? Ooh, I think both. I mean, it is super influential, uh, and it comes with values, and I think that's the whole thing. Um, using ethics as a way to, to 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 load technology with values from inside, as it were, rather than to stand on the outside mm -hmm. and see if you want to accept it or want to reject it. That's the biggest challenge, I would say. What you've seen, of course, in, in previous in previous years with the design, of course, like artificial intelligence and, and computer science, is that ethics was usually added as a later element of, uh, of those courses rather than from the initial initial beginning point. So, yeah. do you think that we risk being at a similar point right now, where education will have to catch up with the developments in society? Mm, I think um, maybe a bit. Yeah, I think. Uh, the impact of AI, of course, becomes clear as soon as it is already working. Anticipating the impacts is hard. And that, there are tools for this, there are ways in which we can, can do this. Uh, so people are also working on that quite actively. But typically the impact shows itself when it's there. And then it's kind of mutual adaptation, I would say. We will now have to adapt our education to ChatGPT, our examination. And yeah, I think that's the biggest challenge, one of the biggest ones for the coming years in education. Yeah, um, maybe when it comes to, um, to developments in, in education in recent decades, um, Dutch society has been moving more and more towards a status economy, where the label in your, um, uh, in your diploma, uh, MBO, HBO or WAO, uh, is getting more and more important. Um, and the same, uh, the same experts are saying this is a development for the worse. Um, so my, my question would be, what, what is the UFA doing to counter uh, the status, the importance of status labels? So you're doing MBO, uh, haha, uh, the, uh, how are you going to counter it? It's super hard to understand you, yes. actually. <laughs> Half of the audience. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe to repeat the question. Yes. Shall I repeat uh, the question? Now? The status labels. Yes, because uh, also the minister of, of education has been quite uh, vocal on this. I would say that there needs to be a reappreciation of, for example, MBO. Is there anything the UVA is doing to, you know, counter the importance of uh, status labels? So, I'm still not sure if I've fully got what you want to ask. 
just it's hard to keep my mind here. But you mean uh, the importance of moving up on the ladder from MBO to HBO to ah, or, or also um, appreciating people who, who are doing MBO, for example. Because now, nowadays you see oh, uh, some kind of look down upon uh, in that sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you ask yourself if, if, if Uva can play a role in this discussion? Yes. Maybe. I think um, I don't recognize an atmosphere here of seeing uh, academic education as the highest education. Uh, okay, think th th that feeling isn't even here. Is I think uh, we are really open uh, for people who want to develop further based on also their own previous education. But I, I, I wouldn't know why we would feel that this is better. It's different. I mean, I really like the image of Dijkgraaf. It always says it's not a letter, yeah. it's a wire in Dutch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. English words. Yeah. I think that's the way to go. We all contribute to our society in our own ways. And that's uh, how we also want to run our education and our research at this university. Okay, great. Of course, you have children yourself as well. Did you ever, not necessarily the word push them, but maybe encourage them to try and achieve the higher levels of the, of the Dutch uh, secondary education system? Ooh. I always try to help them to get the best out of themselves, but it doesn't mean that they have to, to, to do the so-called highest form of education. Mm -hmm. I think uh, our third son uh, doesn't want to go to university like his two older brothers, but wants to go to art school. That's not an issue, I would say, actually to the contrary. It's, it's great. I, I, I actually was in doubt myself whether I wanted to study music or uh, something academic. So. Uh, I think the whole high-low distinction is a very, very problematic one. Do you think, in retrospect, you made the right decision going into academia rather than music? <laughs> maybe after this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, maybe re-evaluating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I think to close it off, uh, we were also wondering, there's always a lot of competition with the VU uh, um, and is also a lot, lot of <laughs> collaboration. But I mean, if people go study in Amsterdam, they cho choose between VU and UVA. Is, is there one thing you can name that Uva definitely uh, does better than the food? <laughs> wow, that's a nasty question. Um, I think they have a different um, identity, and I think it has to fit you. I think uh, Uva is maybe slightly more progressive than uh, the food, but they are both really very, very good universities. So um, I, I would not want to say anything negative about the food. No, yeah. And also don't think we need advertisement ourselves because yeah, that's we, we talked the about the, uh, yeah, the huge interest already. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then maybe to give you an opportunity to defend yourself, in what ways do you think the UFA is better than the VU? <laughs> mm, I would not definitely say we are better, we are different. And what I really, really like about UFA, why I really like to work here is, I think as I said in the beginning, it's top university, it's excellent work, super society engaged and super progressive. I mean, also the debate we had here shows that we are in the midst of society, we're inventing what academia can mean in the 21st century. It's sometimes hard, as we've seen, but this is what makes it really exciting, I think, to, uh, to study and to work at this wonderful university. I think that's a good, good note to close today's interview with. Um, we will be back here next week uh, with an interview with Marijke van Schaik, which is the Secretary General of the Red Cross of the Netherlands. We would like to thank you all for joining and being here today. Um, and we hope to see you another time. All of our interviews are available on YouTube and on Spotify. And you can, of course, also follow us on social media. And of thank course, a big thank you to Mr. Uh, Perbe for being here. For joining uh, us. I, I can imagine it wasn't uh, easy, um, but we appreciate you taking the time of uh, sure. being here and answering all the questions. It was a pleasure. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>